we joke around, and I call this thing a Longhorn Lexus, but was there ever a discussion of, you know what, let's not make a capstone, let's make a Lexus version of a Tundra? Uh, honestly, no. Why is that? No, because uh, Lexus, you know, the direction of Lexus isn't pickup trucks. Okay. And uh, we have our trucks in Lexus, the LX is in there, yeah. and, and it's a good vehicle, but Lexus is more SUVs than past cars. It's a great time to be in the industry, right? There's just a lot of stuff going on and trucks are fun. So uh, I love my job, I love what we do, and, and I'm a truck guy. So when we looked at our, our trucks and what to put in the bed, one of the things we needed to do is take some mass out of the truck. Because of our new powertrain, all the driveline had to increase and it got more heavier, mm. um, to just put it mildly. So where do I take mass out? So we started looking at the bed to take mass out of the bed. At the same time, we purchased a truck with a million miles on it that a customer put, and that customer used his truck as a work truck, not as, as a daily driver. Mm. And uh, it was 10 years old, had a million miles on it, he ran hot shot, and I wanted that truck to tear it down. What can we learn about it? So in, in Toyota world, the next generation truck has to be better than the last generation truck. And that's all based on our Land Cruiser philosophy. We have targets set on how much it has to improve, but it's also about where we find areas of customer voice that we need to improve. So the, this truck was, the timing was perfect, right? We tore it down, every nut and bolt, we popped every spot weld and checked the strength, but the bed showed its wear. The rest of the truck was quite, quite beautiful for the, the mileage on it, but the bed was beat to pieces. And so that was an area we wanted to improve, but we also had to take mass out. So we looked at high strength steel, opposed to our mild steel. We looked at aluminum. Everybody's seen the bed wars and we know what we talk about in beds. But we had another weapon in our pocket and that was a composite bed. We use it on Tacoma. And so we started looking at it. It's lighter than steel, it's heavier than aluminum, mm. but we can make it very durable. It doesn't corrode, so you don't have any rust in the, in the bed. It doesn't dent, so uh, I, burn wood at my house and I throw wood in the back of my truck and you know if you put a drop in bed liner you can hide the damage if mm. you have a spray in bed liner they're great but they show the damage mm. how do we stop the damage was it so we really put a lot of emphasis on stopping any corrosion in the bed taking mass out of the bed and making the bed where it's better than anybody else's bed in the in the industry to prevent damage, which helps your resale value. Can you put more innovation in a composite bed? Oh, you can. We can put storage boxes and these type of things in it. Um, Tacoma has storage boxes in it. We looked at what our customers are actually using the bed for. Mm. And even the tailgates, you know, everybody's got some kind of fancy tailgate. Um, you know, it's kind of like the machine that goes beep. It, it, they're cool, <laughs> but... Uh, What's the real purpose we need behind to, I just got to interject here. You and I need to do a whole episode just on Monty Python. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you'd appreciate that one. Okay. Anyway, go on. I interrupt. So, uh, you know, what do people use their tailgate for? Yeah. And I'm not going to say there's one better than another, but what I do know is our customers use their tailgates for loading, mm. and they have to support dynamic mass of snowmobiles, motorcycles, ATVs, where I was lacking is the UTV. The 50 inch UTVs, people are loading in the back of their truck, the side-by-sides, yeah. and they were denting our tailgate with those. So we changed our tailgate construction, so the reinforcements that are in the tailgate, we went to a vertical construction, a new patented design, to make our tra tailgate stronger. Our tailgate doesn't flip and flop and do these type of things, mm. but it's very strong and it can meet that customer's need, and that's how we make the decision. Do you see more innovation being layered on as this generation ages? Oh, absolutely. Model life management's important, and as customers ask for more features, yeah. you know, I need this to do that, we're, we're gonna adjust our, our designs to, to meet those requirements. Any things you're thinking of? I have a lot of things, but if I share them with you, then I have to kill you, so I, I can't say. I don't know about that, man. We're in California. I don't think <laughs> do that. Maybe in Michigan I'd be afraid to come visit you. Uh, let's switch gears a little bit. So, innovation. Last time you and I got together, there was like 85 flavors of Tundra. Now there's 86. Yep. We've got this one behind us. 
When you first set out to imagine what a Tundra was, did you ever think there'd be one to be 75 grand? Uh, not in my wildest dreams. Yeah. Not in my wildest dreams, and I'll, I'll so be honest. So how do you get there? So as we went out and started doing our market research, what we found out is there was 13% of the market we weren't even playing in. We have the 1794, it's a beautiful truck. And uh, the Platinum, you know, is more of an urban truck. The 1794 is more of a Midwestern truck. My competition, we're offering higher grade trucks. And what we heard from our customer base is, I'm coming out of a luxury SUV, but, and I want a pickup truck, but you know, I don't want to give up this feature. I don't want to give up the sophistication mm -hmm. of my interior. I really want better leather and real wood and these type of things. So we set out, how do we really show luxury? And we've got Lexus, we, we produce Lexus and we, we know what our flavor of luxury is, but how do you take that and put it in a truck? So we started looking at materials mm. and what type of materials are necessary. We brought in Bentleys, we bought, brought in Rolls Royces. It wasn't benchmarking our competitors. I would pay competitors. money to see you drive a Rolls Royce. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we brought them in. And I, what we were trying to understand is really what is luxury yeah. without being gaudy? How do you give a true luxury interior to a pickup truck? And we put what we call semi-aniline leather in there, or we call it shelf one leather. It's the same leather we put in the LS. It's the only other Toyota vehicle with this leather in it. I took that in. How do you convince the people? Oh, well, so that's a great question. So I, at the time, I was, uh, when we were working on this, I was also a member of what we call CV company in Japan. The, we have different divisions yeah. uh, for the vehicles. Pickup trucks and trucks in general fall under CV company, commercial vehicle company. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine me walking in and, and I was showing this truck, our idea, the, the model of the interior to Akio. And Akio says, um, this is nice, but who wants this leather in a commercial vehicle? Oh, let me, let me share with them. So I shared the data with them. This is what's happening. As we noticed, there was a natural progression of people moving into pickup trucks. We see From them go- luxury SUVs. Yeah, we see them, you know, as they have young families, they have minivans, and minivans are moving to SUVs, and as they, their kids grow up or they become empty nesters, they're moving yeah. into luxury SUVs. And then, finally, everybody comes around that they really would love the utility of having a pickup truck. And, and how long ago was this discussion with Akio? Oh, boy. That would probably be back in 17. Was there ever a discussion with him or amongst your group that like, okay, we joke around and I call this thing a Longhorn Lexus, but was there ever a discussion of, you know what, let's not make a capstone, let's make a Lexus version of a Tundra? Uh, honestly, no. Why is that? No, because uh, Lexus, you know, the direction of Lexus isn't pickup trucks. Okay. And uh, we have our trucks in Lexus, the LX is in there. Yeah. And, and it's a good vehicle, but Lexus is more SUVs than past cars. Being in trucks as long as I've had, I thought, well, 1794 is it, you know. No mm. one's gonna pay this kind of money for a truck. And I was wrong. You know, they introduced them and we're seeing that. Were you wrong or did the market change? I think the market changed. I think yeah. we have a different customer coming in. You know, pickup trucks used to be work trucks. You owned a pickup truck, you had roll down windows, these, this type of thing. You didn't have all the creature comforts yeah. that a car has in it. But even in small cars, we see creature comforts coming down into them. You know, it wasn't too long ago when you bought a Corolla, you couldn't get power windows and air conditioning Absolutely. and that type of thing. And you see all that, those luxury features become standard equipment on I cars. think it's crazy you can get a Corolla with a power seat. <laughs> exactly, right? <laughs> so what, what you're seeing now is, is, again, people have become accustomed to the features that they had in the vehicle and they are now transitioning into a pickup truck. Mm. And they want the same creature comforts. Was there ever a discussion, whether it's with Akio or Kevin in design, of are we slicing the pizza so thin and there's no differentiation? With, with styling, you can never slice it too thin. They, they love to have yeah. different things. So even the number of grills we have yeah. is something that they love. I love as an engineer that I can offer a different flavor. And that's one of the criticisms we received mm. from our own customer base is, how do I tell the difference when I buy up in a, in a pickup? In 14, when we launched Platinum in 1794, we started playing around in that. Yeah. But on the interior, you knew what you got. On the exterior, when you drive up next to an SR5, the guy next to you may not know you're driving a 1794. So those type of things, we started really focusing on 
in this, in this market. And with this, it allowed us to put the materials and the sophistication that you may not have in a 1794. At the end of the day, the material's more expensive. The truck is more expensive to build. Mm. The bigger struggle we had with this is the variation in the plant, mm. right? There's limited floor space, and, and how do you handle these materials? Because mm. you, you have to be extremely careful during the manufacturing process that we're, we're not damaging anything, bringing it into the truck. So you can imagine coming from a seat supplier and you've got this beautiful leather, mm. how do you keep it clean through the whole manufacturing process? And how many seats can you put on the line? How many grills can you have in there? And we changed our manufacturing process to accept the extra variation. I didn't have that capability until we redesigned the truck. So some of our items are commonized now. I have one transmission, mm. I have one engine and I put the MG in there uh, to make the hybrid. Mm. But the engine transmission between, between the gas version and the hybrid engine, they're the same. So mm. I took variation out there and I put that variation in other places in the Like plant. the seats? Like the seats. Okay, so this is the point of the episode where once again we have gotta turn this around to the audience. We gotta basically ask them for what they wanna see in a Tundra going forward. Absolutely, and from what Love I found, they are more vocal with you than anyone else. I don't know what it is. I think they have a personal relationship with you. Do you, yeah. do you know all these people? Well, I have a lot send, send me, you know, letters of, of hate and stuff, but uh. <laughs> okay. okay, you know what? We'll take letters of hate, we'll take letters of praise. Uh, but basically we're looking for feedback on, I, I think it should be future innovation should be the theme. Maybe not a totally new Tundra, but what do they want to see going down the road there? And not is, just limited to the bed. That is one example. Yeah. But there's certain characteristics we will never change in a Toyota truck. You're going to get a bulletproof powertrain. Okay. You're going to have off-road capabilities. Yeah. This truck, we heard from our customers, they really wanted more towing capability. We focused on towing. We focused on the, the, the part coming back saying, hmm, you know, 1794 is nice, but it's really not nice enough. Okay, so we, we're adding that. We, you know, you, you, you said people talk to me because I really want to hear the voice of the customer and we really want to put that voice in. Yeah. I'm a truck guy, I know what I like in a truck, but my flavor he's may not, not be something. He's not a truck guy, he's a farmer. He does this as a hobby. We discussed this <laughs> yes, last time. Yes, it's true. So let's limit this. You delivered on some of the stuff they asked you last generation. I think this is more, like we said, about innovation. Like, what kind of innovation can we add to this moving forward? Yeah. Uh, like in the bed, or not just in the bed, I'm thinking some well, of this stuff. So, look at the electronics in there. Yeah. And, and some of the things we could not do in the past because we didn't have the electrical architecture to support it, yeah. that's all been changed in this truck. So, I think we talked before, I wasn't an EPS, electric power steering fan at all. Yes. I'm an off-roader, I like to know where my wheels are. I don't like the delay that we felt in there. Mm. We worked really hard to take all that out. And then we were able to innovate it where as I change my drive modes, it's changing the input for the steering. My steering presets change. My braking changes. Now, before you go farther down that road, the, the parameters were set on EPAS from product planning or because you were trying to hit efficiency targets? Why did you say definitely EPAS as opposed to hydraulic? We changed it, we changed to uh, EPS because I have to offer the latest safety systems in the vehicle. Mm. So lane trace assist, uh, emergency braking, these type of things. So it was dictated by product planning? It was dictated by our safety group. Okay. That we would have to put these in here. I can't do that with hydraulic steering. Okay. So I had to go to EPS, but it was a fight. We had an arm wrestling competition yeah. and that didn't work, so we leg wrestled. And finally, it was okay, rock, next paper, time that sisters. Happens, can I come and Absolutely. film that? Because I want to see who wins. Absolutely. Well, yeah, obviously, I lost on the hydraulic steering. <laughs> okay. but, but, you know, necessity drives innovation. Yeah. And so I laid down to our en chassis engineers, this is what I want the system to do. Yeah. And then as we started reaching those targets that we set out, we also, it opened our eyes that, hey, we don't have to limit it to these things. Now, when we're changing the drive mode, and I go into mogul mode or I go into rock mode, mm. I can make the steering do something else. And the, oh, the other benefit that we realize as we're off-roading is I don't need a steering stabilizer anymore because the EPS won't let the wheels shift mm. like a hydraulic steering wheel. This guy has got the best attitude I've ever seen. When you get stuff foisted upon him, you turn it and you basically, you're the kid that makes 
lemonade out of lemons. Like yeah. you weren't, you gave me the story about the, I don't want, the, I, don't, I didn't want an EV range, but you got it anyway and you got it for free. We got it for free, but okay. we didn't, we didn't base the development on the EV range. Yeah. That wasn't the target. It's just an extra bonus that comes along with the powertrain, yeah. right? Yeah. And uh, because of that, because we focused all on power, the power modes are fantastic in the engine. It's it's doing what it the customer wants it to do without the customer ever knowing it's doing it, right? Okay, I'm gonna cut you off there because this is what we gotta turn around to the audience. They're gonna give us feedback and you and I are gonna talk again, but we're gonna do a longer form episode this time because I wanna do an Inside the Moto Man studio with you. The whole okay. background of how you became a farmer and then you got into this hobby of being <laughs> chief engineer of a Toyota full-size pickup truck. So uh, that's in the comments below or via our social media, Moto Man TV, all one word, Moto Man TV, all one word, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Do you follow me on Moto Man TV, all one word? I can't tell you that. Don't yes, listen, I do. Don't listen to this guy. Anyway, uh, and then we will get this man back on the show and we'll go through some of your comments together and have a longer episode to discuss. Oh, you know what? We're going to do something before that. We're going to talk about Sequoia, too. Anyway, until we see you guys in the next episode, bishop